All right, guys. Uh, I am once again getting over some kind of mysterious crud here and stuff like that, and uh, I am so weak today. I think Booster Gold could kick my ass, so I'm trying to look tough, you know. So anyway, I've still been able to uh, get out and about and pick up some stuff. Uh, and just kind of shooting this video to get this stuff out there and to get it put up. Okay, so first we'll start with some VHS and DVD and some comics and stuff. Kind of move a little bit fast here so what we can do and stuff. But, uh, you know, got some really cool stuff, at least, you know, by my standards and stuff. These were 50 cents a piece. I already had these on DVD. I've got uh, some uh, magazines and uh, the 1964, uh, I think, Gold Key uh, comic that came out in the 60s and stuff. But I'm a huge Johnny Quest fan. So uh, I went ahead and picked these up for shits and giggles because, like I said, they were at a Goodwill for 50 cents, man. But here's three episodes of uh, Johnny Quest on a sun-bleached copy <laughs> of, uh, of a VHS that came out. I think these came out in the late, well, late 80s is what I was going to say, but apparently this is, you know, 1990 and stuff. comes with uh, Pirates from Below, Werewolf, the Timberland, and the Invisible Monsters. Of course, the Invisible Monster is considered the classic episode probably on this one and stuff, but Werewolf of the Timberland is very underrated. Um, so, yeah, if you uh, know anything about Johnny Quest and Doug Wadley and all that stuff like that, some great stuff, great stuff. All right, and then I got this. I went back and forth. It's a clamshell. This came through Cartoon Network in the mid-'90s sometime, and I remember being very... Um, I don't know what the word is. Geek rage wouldn't be it, but I was just sort of like, how dare they? But, you know, it's out there. It's happened. So, you know, a little bit of nostalgia stuff. But uh, in a clamshell, I got Johnny Quest versus the Cyber Insects. Yeah, I'd, I'd be amazed if I ever really watched that. They were all together and stuff. And then I was really, this is probably like my second or third copy. I will pick up this and any kind of Ralph Batsky uh, kind of cartoons or anything like that from the uh, 80s and stuff, uh, even 70s. Uh, on this, but uh, I got me another copy of Fire and Ice. This is where Ralph Batsky brought in uh, Frank Frazetta. So, uh, very cool. Yes, it was rotoscoping and stuff, but one of the great stories that's come out of this, if you've ever watched this, you know, it is animated. Uh, of course, you know, rotoscoped over actors and stuntmen and stuff, but the, the one of the great stories that come out of this is Frank Frazetta. You gotta understand, Frank Frazetta was like you know, he could have been like a minor slash major league baseball player. The man had a stroke and he just figured out how, to, he just went ahead and started drawing with the other hand. Uh, this man took on, like when he was in his 70s, uh, two pit bulls or something, Rockweilers or something came at him and he was able to get past them without hurting the dogs or himself and getting in the house. I mean, this guy was a man's man. To do his art in the 50s, there's this great picture of him where he's made like this big spear and he's got the pompadour and the white t-shirt and the jeans and he's in the middle of the woods looking like some freaking barbarian in the wrong time period and stuff things like that so what happened was is when some of the stuntmen or actors or something were sort of uh, supposed to be acting like the cavemen that he put in here and stuff he was like that's not how you're supposed to act so he went out there and showed him how to act and they all looked at the director and stuff and the, they were sitting there like we'll get hurt if we do that you know so yeah, it's kind of, Frank Frazetta stories are so fucking cool. Then I got these two because, uh, you know, they were 50 cents also. Coneheads, the movie, <laughs> which I think came out 10 years too late. I think this thing would have been a bigger hit if it came out around uh, closer to Dan Aykroyd's stint on Saturday Night Live. And I got The Wedding Singer, which was supposed to have been like the start of the 80s nostalgia and the 90s and stuff, you know. Uh, then I found this for uh, $3.97 at FYE. Uh, Necessary Evil, Super Villains of DC Comics, a little documentary on them. I watched this somewhere on some pirated, you know, it was pirated channel or something like that. It, it kind of kept my interest, but I figured let's give it another chance, which was fantastic. All right, then I did a road trip for me because, God forbid, I have some kind of life outside of work, you know, and I ended up picking up a, a few things on my road trips out of state. Like I said, I've really started not being as open to where I get this stuff or where I go basically because of people in my real life watching my videos and running into dicks who are running to all these places that I talk about, you know, trying to be helpful and stuff. But anyway, I found this. This was very cool. Um, this was at, a, some of this stuff is at a Books A Million, but they had a flash sale going on. This was three ninety seven, but they had a flash sale going on. So I think it was like maybe 10% off or something. But anyway, I got an illustrated um, sequential art comic book form story of The Little Prince. 
And when I was really young, six, seven years old or something like that, Showtime, and I know I'm not crazy, Showtime had a whole bunch of claymation um, claymation shows they would show. Each one was a story. One was a serialized version of some uh, rich man that drove a gold Studebaker or a gold car or something. He had animals living with him and he had a bridge that you know would always shake and tumble and stuff as he rode down to town and stuff like that. I remember seeing uh, I'll see I have vague memories of him. Uh, Rumpelstiltskin the story, of, not Rumpelstiltskin, good god like I said, I've been sick and I'm weak now. I'm going blank on who. It. Rip Van Winkle. The story of Rip Van Winkle uh, sleeping for like 20 or 30 years, you know, waking up in new colonial times and all this stuff. Uh, and I remember seeing, I think it was a Nutcracker Suite. And I swear it opened up with somebody telling the story of the Bagman or the Ragman, who was this creepy thin guy who would have a big bag full of kids on his back. And he would look in the windows to see if the kids were really sleeping by bedtime. I'm never able to find it. But they also did the Little Prince. And the Little Prince just blew me away about how sacred something can be. It really is a, a story that you can apply to a lot of things, uh, including your collecting. Like, I could get rid of a comic book that uh, I had when I was a kid, you know, sell it, lose it, whatever, and yeah, I could replace it, but it's still not that comic that I had in my hands that was actually there. And with his rose and the fox and the snake coming after him and this pilot out in the desert. Uh, the French really have some... Uh, I've always enjoyed anything that comes out of, the, of out of France and stuff that I've been able to uh, get a hold of. Um, you know, their comics, their sci-fi, their, their their stories, their fairy tales, there's something extra there, really original and fresh by the time they get over here. Are things lost in translation? I'm sure they are, you know. So, anyway, enough of that. You can tell I'm very happy to have that. Uh, jumping on the Paper Girls. Uh, heard a lot of great things about this from a lot of great people. Went ahead and picked Volume 1 up. This was also part of the flash sale, which is why I got it. Uh, also, while I was out of town, I stopped in a store, got these for a buck a piece. Uh, I needed this to com help complete my DC 1 million uh, crossovers and stories and things. This did come out a few years after DC 1 million, but this is the JLA 80 page giant number two that I needed. Uh, this was actually a sought after book for a while. Brian Hitch cover, some Brian Hitch art in here, I think. A few short stories. Uh, and then I got these. Uh, I had a chance to get them when they came out in the early 90s, but this was Marvel Comics doing some rock and roll type comics. And Neil Gaiman came on and did this uh, three-part uh, The Last Temptation of Alice Cooper, who Neil Gaiman was white hot thanks to his Sandman work and stuff. I gotta find book three. I read it back in the day, and I'll be honest with you, I was not impressed, but we'll see how it looks through wiser eyes. Okay, then I got this on eBay. And uh, I always, I, I, I kind of dig series like these little mini series and stuff. And when this was coming out, I didn't get it because I was kind of wondering why are they doing this? this? This could be a rehash of the DC Universe or something, right? And now that time has gone by, um, it's kind of letting you know this was sort of a bookend on the DC Comics proper post-crisis universe, if you will, before the DC 52 came out, kind of showing that official history. Uh, and I have a few issues here and there. It was enough to pique my interest because of the talent they had on it. But we got Joe Kubert and the Kuberts on here. Lynn Wine was writing this, um, you know, going from the 40s up until the, the present day with things that was going on. Here's number one. This was a 10 issue uh, miniseries. And like I said, to me, I felt like it was meant to be a bookend for the 52. Uh, number three and four, Garcia Lopez is on this. Brian Boland did some art. Uh, little backup stories in each one with some really great talent and stuff. Uh, really, really, really is in uh, these covers. Two, these covers all go together. with connecting curve covers two at a time. But uh, the ones that I really wanted out of this was issue five and six because they brought George Perez back in here, and he comes in here and he does this art that is right on par with DC uh, with Crisis on Infinite Earth that he did back in eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, whatever. Uh, back in the day and yes these are all connecting covers but I'm just getting this video out so uh, I always wanted these because I'm collecting anything that's crisis uh, proper and stuff getting that up there uh, then we make it into the 90s with number seven paralleling the uh, doomsday bane uh, takedown of Superman and Batman in the 90s and how it affected and we go on through there and it's really nice a really nice retelling of uh, DC throughout the years and stuff and 10 you know up into the modern age and stuff so that was kind of cool got that pretty cheap these probably i think these came to 90 cents a piece with the price that i paid on ebay 
And I want to say there's free shipping, but that doesn't sound right. I don't know. Okay, then I picked up uh, these for... Oh, by the way, yeah, one more eBay pickup here. I got Paper Girls number one proper. Uh, newer books and series that are coming out, honestly, I keep having like this 10-year window that kind of keeps expanding a little bit to where there's no letter pages, the advertisements aren't that big of a deal. These story arcs are written with trade paperbacks in mind uh, and also with the cost and things to where I'm starting to think maybe the first one or two issues of a series is worth getting unless you really love it to where you might be more beneficial to just start getting more modern stories and stuff and trade and stuff. That's my opinion, right? So I got Paper Girls number one and now I have it in trade. If I read the trade and feel like it's something I really enjoy, like Hillbilly or something, I'll get the individual issues to support the book, you know, the best I can. I still get them at discounts, you know, online shopping. So yeah, I got that pretty cheap. I think that was like two bucks on eBay and I heard it was a hard, hot book. Um, and then before I show the big ones that I kind of got, I'll show you the stuff I got for 50 cents a piece while I was traveling for work. Um, this I got this just, it's like an Adam Hughes cover and he does the artwork in here and stuff. But I got this just to kind of complete the set. Uh, for some reason over the years I either didn't buy this or it kind of got lost over the years. But Justice League number 34, just to kind of complete that set. I did a video a few months ago. Pick this up for a buddy who needed it. I already have it. Back to that Johnny Quest thing. This is Amazing Heroes where this, if you're a Johnny Quest fan, you have to get this. Uh, special all Johnny Quest issues. This is Amazing Heroes number 95. Doug Wiley's in here. The history of Johnny Quest. It goes episode through episode of each one with a little synopsis. I think there's a, like a little review. Just, just, just a really fun, great little book if you're a Johnny Quest fan. Uh, like I said, picked that up for a friend. Um, already texted him. He was like, woo, you know. Uh, then these were 50 cents a piece. I got a getting closer to. The, 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 the Baxter series from the 80s that I'm trying to complete are the Legion of Superheroes and the Teen Titans books. Getting really close to both of them. The Teen Titans book, I kind of have a cutoff point. Uh, maybe the first 100 issues uh, is probably what I'm just going to try with them. But I found these for 50 cents a piece. And these are good and cheap. That's why I like them. And the Legion is not something that I push on people. Uh, just growing up with comics and reading them, I started right off with the reprints of the Silver Age, maybe a few Superboy and the Legion, uh, superheroes of the 70s with Mike Grell and Dave Cockrum. Uh, the Legion really kind of paved the way for uh, some of the artists and designs and stuff of uh, the X-Men, um, like, you know, Timberwolf, designed by Dave Cockrum, was really, really close to what Wolverine became. And even when Dave Cockrum came on the X-Men book in the late 70s there with Chris Claremont, they did the uh, Royal Guard or something, the Shi'ar Empire, which was like a nod and a wink to Dave Cockrum's work on Legion of Superheroes because the Royal Guard is actually, you know, the Legion of Superheroes when you look at it sideways there. But Steve Lytle did some work on this. Steve Lytle was a great underrated artist. Um, and like I said, if you're a Legion fan, you'll like this stuff. If not, I've never really figured out why I like the Legion. It's not quite the... It's, it's a very underrated, great group book, but it's really a world of to its own, uh, which is kind of what makes it cool. Uh, and yes, they've screwed it up, you know, since 89, left and right, and fixed things, and it's had its ups and downs. But yeah, um, this is just good stuff, the Magic Wars and stuff. So, well, I had this. This is the last issue. But when I, when I got those 50 cent books, I had more there that I was going to get. And I was walking out of this, this particular comic book store, uh, the guy looked at me and said, well, right over there, I've got about 14 boxes that are two bucks a piece. The books are two bucks a piece in them, unless otherwise marked. And I didn't think I really had that much time. And then I looked down there and I saw them and I flew through them pretty quick. I've gotten pretty good over the years of going through a box. I can work the fingers, if you will. And I found a few things in there that had me do a double take. So I went ahead and got them and put some of the 50 cent books back, right? First thing I got here, this is now a 10, 10 to $12 book. This thing was hot for a while. I saw this thing peak at like 90 bucks. I've seen graded copies go for $125 and up, depending on the grade and stuff. And I had this the one I have off the rack, but it's well loved and yellowed pages. But this thing has creamy pages and stuff. First appearance of Superboy Prime, DC Comics Presents number 87. For four bucks. So yeah, I got that. And then I about fell down when I saw these. I already had these. I told people almost six months in advance to go ahead and get this book and to look out for it. It's become a little bit of a hot book, low print run, great uh, creator on it, great one-part stories that all seem to be weaving into a 
bigger picture, if you will. But uh, for four bucks less than cover price, three ninety five, if you will, three ninety nine. I got me a Hillboy number, uh, Hillbilly number one, and four cents less than cover price, Hillbilly number two. Yes, these might go on eBay, so I can put that money back into other comics. All right, guys. That is the haul. Thanks for sticking in here. Let's get this thing uploaded. Let's try to have a life. Let's get this house cleaned up. Maybe I'll shoot another video today, you know. So, all right. Drink my coffee. And cheers. Have a great weekend.